because the whole SRE world is about learning different tools, learning different ways to do things, and uh, learning how to do them well, right? Doing things the right way, the consistent way, the secure way, letting it scale. Welcome. You are listening to the Modern Tech Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Christian Galvin, broadcasting from the research triangle to the world. I will provide a weekly analysis for high performers who need to stay up to speed on the latest insights for business, cybercrime, emerging technologies, and the future of a human culture. Get ready to be inspired and stay ahead of the game with the Modern Tech Leaders Podcast. We are doing episode number four. And today we're going to be talking about the life of an SRE with a former colleague of mine, Tyler Glensky. We're going to discuss anything from what an SRE is, what it's like to work in, in the field for that, and also why businesses should be hiring an SRE. So thanks for joining us today, Tyler. Hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, man, it's a pleasure to chat with you. I know last time we we saw each other was in Austin, Texas. So that was really cool because most of the people that I do interview – some I haven't met in person or it's all virtual. So having met you in Texas was really cool. And also you're much taller. You know, when you meet with colleagues, you see each other on Zoom, being able to meet someone in person is always better. Yeah, totally. Definitely. People always look different in person than they do on Zoom, right? And they always sound different too. Yeah. Nervous. So far from what I know is that Google created the first SRE team back in 2003 and they had different challenges that they were trying to solve back then. When websites were being launched by e-commerce, they needed to launch them in a way that they were scalable and had good reliability in order to not have downtime. They also had a complex infrastructure pr prior to having public cloud. And also there was like no DevOps back then. So could you tell us about who you are, how you got into the field and what you did before your current role? Yeah, definitely. So I uh, was in the Marines from 2011 to 2015. And then after that, I used my GI Bill to go to school and majored in computer science with a focus in software engineering. I wanted to do software engineering, right? So I was looking at a bunch of guides of how to get into the field, what the biggest market shares were, and then I found React. So I actually started learning JavaScript, different frameworks, how to use JSON, you know, very basic things. And then that led me to do some open source for a free code camp, actually. And I wrote some of their guides and uh, did some few pull requests on their engine. Their, uh, it's like a self-guided tutorial thing. And that kind of led me to get some freelancing and contracting roles. And uh, I worked with my dad actually very early on. He had his own contracting company and uh, doing software engineering, general IT, just stuff like that. And after that, I was graduating and I started applying to different roles, mostly JavaScript and Python. And I kind of fell into a junior SRE role for a European company. And it was pretty cool. It was a good company. It was fun to work for. Uh, they had multiple products, multiple clouds. So it was a lot of exposure really early on to different technologies. From there, I gained the experience I needed and then moved to another company within the crypto space and then everything got way cooler. You know, I was able to use a lot of more Linux, a lot more Docker and orchestration tools. And that's about it really. That kind of brings me to where I am now, but as far as how I got into it. So one thing I would take away from that is try to get as much exposure to different things as you can, because the whole SRE world is about learning different tools, learning different ways to do things and uh, learning how to do them well, right? Doing things the right way, the consistent way, the secure way, letting it scale. Yeah, so I want to go back to what you mentioned. So you mentioned you were contributing to Free Code Camp. And when people are getting started, whether they're in school or they're early on in their career, they feel like they really can't contribute to the community uh, for many reasons, maybe because they're still getting that exposure or they're still trying to figure out where they want to go. What would you say was the benefit of being able to contribute to something like that? It was a huge benefit, especially because at first I kept it very, very simple, like explaining arrow syntax of a function, right? Like that's a very simple thing for their tutorials. 
However, it was open source. It counted its contributions. To me, half the battle was formatting and commenting slash documenting your code to fit to like that repository's template because you want everything to be uniform. They have guidelines, how to contribute. And then once you get through all that and figure all that out and figure out Git and how to push, pull, merge, open PR, commit, and all that properly, that takes away a lot of the fight with open source. And then from there, it's just doing the code and or fixing the bug or doing the thing, right? And then opening the pull request and getting it approved. Did you use GitHub in college particularly, or was that something you did on your own time outside of classes? I did that on my own time. I was very lucky. My dad lived a few blocks from me and he was a software engineer his whole life. So he, he said, learn how to use GitHub, learn Python, maybe some JavaScript. You should understand C, but you don't have to be really good at it. Just understand low level code versus high level, like Python or interpreted, you know, compiled versus interpreted, like understand these concepts of different things to where if you ever had to dive into it, you would already know enough to really kind of get started. So th yes, I started using GitHub on my own. It was not a thing my university talked about, uh, as like set up your GitHub, this is your school account things like that, we, they would talk about it in like comments of like, like discussion groups. So we'd say, Hey, look at this GitHub mm -hmm. repo, right? Or look at my GitHub repo, this code I did on the side when we were just chit chatting in our chat rooms. So I went, I went to school completely online. Yeah. And a lot of people go to school online these days. And I remember when I was going through my associates before I got into my bachelor's, we were learning like how to code and doing the fundamentals, but a lot of it was like in like uh, Dreamweaver. I don't know if you remember Dreamweaver. I remember, it like but I've never used it. It was, like, it was like such an old school way of, of doing things. And I do feel that sometimes when, you, when you're at university, they're trying to teach you like the very fundamentals that sometimes are not it, showing you like what's innovative and, and what companies are, are using at the time. So the fact that your dad told you about that, I think that's very helpful. And nowadays people who are like on TikTok, like they have like a whole tech engineering segment of TikTok and even my cousin, she was telling me like, yeah, like there's these people who are like suggesting to individuals who want to get into tech, like create a GitHub profile, start coding, start looking up YouTube videos and start contributing. And that's probably like a faster way to say it in the field, would you say, than, than taking like years on trying to just learn fundamentals. Yeah, definitely. I went to school because it was free. I don't want to bad talk universities because they do have, you know, like they are useful. They're very useful. And some are very super useful. They're amazing, right? They have some amazing computer science programs and everything. However, it's not a requirement for our field. And that's what I like about it. You know, that's one thing I really like about tech and engineering is you don't have to go to school for it. It helps. It really helps a lot, especially when it comes to, you know, salary negotiation and things. And, you know, getting an understanding. It really, it's good at building that foundational level of knowledge. Because that is one thing mm -hmm. that can be missing in a self-taught is, you know, not understanding what's ha happening behind the scenes in the compiler, just knowing how to write the code. You know, that's something some software engineers I've talked to have ran into with self-taught is knowing how to write the code, knowing how to use the code, but not understanding what's going on behind the scenes. Yeah, that's, that's a very key point. And I was actually having a discussion around that topic about like universities, certifications and like the benefit of them. And I think in our field, it's so polarized that some people think there's like only one way, like, no, you don't need university or like, yes, you do need it. And as you mentioned in your experience, in my experience, I've learned that everybody has their own journey and whatever path they want to take should be aligned to their goals. I got into the tech field without a degree, but I pursued it immediately. As soon as I got an entry level job, I was like, I'm going to use my company benefits and I'm going to leverage it so I can understand what's going on at a business level. Cause there was a lot of information I just didn't know. So I found it very good for my career. So I think, I think that's a very good point being cognizant of when people say, Oh, I don't respect people who go to university for, for engineering. I, I think you have a very, very valid point. So what inspired you to get into the field? Would you say it was your dad, your family, or was it just something that you were interested since you were younger? A mixture of a few things. 
So definitely a huge motivating factor with my dad, you know, seeing him working late on projects and for a long time, he did his own contracting thing. So, you know, seeing him on the phone and all that stuff, right? A lot of it also was gaming. I started online computer gaming when I was nine. So I was, no, 10, I was 10, it was 2001. So, <laughs> and the internet back then was horrible, by the way. <laughs> uh, Diablo 2 was fun. That was a good game. All those old games right? and the original RuneScape on Classic. So the very first computer science thing I ever did uh, was write some HTML and copy and paste some JavaScript to uh, build a website for my RuneScape client, right? And uh, when Old School launched and that was fun. So I was really young then. Did I? You know, so. <laughs> I used to love me some RuneScape. <laughs> Again, it was so much fun, man. And I also used like, I think it was called GeoCities. I can't remember, but you can make like a free website and be, you know, star.geocities.com, right? And then also it's, it's interesting, you know, it's one of the fields that is always changing and it's changing at a very fast rate. So there, there's an unlimited amount to learn. You know, you never stop learning in this field. There's always something to do, always something to learn about. Uh, cool new technology coming out you know it, it's not static at all and I, I think that interests me a lot as well the fact that it, it's always changing yeah i have seen that correlation of gaming and technology and software engineering and, and it does certainly make sense if you if you like gaming you're most likely gonna end up in a tech role sooner or later so i have seen that and Definitely helped me be very curious because I don't know if you remember like cheat codes back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> like, like when you're playing like a video game, like you, you go out and you research and to some aspect that definitely feeds to curiosity. And if you're trying to learn how to code, you, you learn how to look things up, like how things work on the back end and how to, how to be efficient. Um, but that definitely does not mean, hey, I'm going to do a workaround and build all this tech debt inside a company but but you know it's definitely a correlation of getting into the field so why would you say companies why should companies like value sres and why should they they hire an sre if if they're looking to scale their company like what are, what are some benefits that you see so the thing about sres is they're super valuable because they show a lot of value they bridge the gap kind of between software engineering and devops so a lot of job ads I would see or uh, blogs talking about what SREs are and things of that sort is software engineers that have an infrastructure and operational mindset and use large range of tools to scale different systems, right? That's a very general definition. So what is the number one thing a business wants to do? Scale. You can't scale your business, especially in the digital world, without SREs, because you'll scale, but you won't scale properly or efficiently, and then that'll lead to more issues and more incidents. Uh, and the more incidents you have, the less reliable your product is and the less customers you're going to have. It's kind of the point where engineering meets business, but it's all engineering. Mostly, unless you're in a manager role and then you have to do like cost efficiency and things of that sort, which, you know, every SRE really should think of cost too, but that's a whole nother topic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. So for businesses to scale, hiring an SRE will definitely help you meet those goals or at least help you understand what the engineering requirements might be for, for your specific company. Have you found that automation is something key for an SRE to, to know how to use like automation frameworks and, and how to simplify. Definitely. Because, all right, so the best thing for an SRE, like the best goal, I think, right, is to automate yourself out of a job. So automate your system so much that, you know, they need less of you because everything can be automated. And especially it can be automated to what I call the 99% to where it's fully automated at the click of a button. So there still is like a human intervention to make sure and get the final okay, right? But yeah, automation tools are a huge necessity and they don't teach a lot of them in school. Like I didn't touch Ansible until I got into the tech world. That should be something that 
inspiring DevOps and SREs touch from day one. So, yeah. And how would you describe Ansible to, to folks listening or watching this in, in simple terms? So Ansible in simple terms is a tool that will take code on my machine and it'll run it on N number of other machines. So I can run code from my machine on say a hundred machines, a thousand machines, 10 machines, one machine. And that's really good for infrastructure and configuring systems, installing things, and even response. Like you could have Ansible that extends a drive on the server and you could fire that off instead of having to go into your cloud or and then SSH into the server, expanding the drive manually. You, know, you just run one script and it expands that drive. Because the alternative to that would be the individual or the team would have to do all of that manually. And how long would that take? On one server, it could take you know, maybe five minutes. On 500, it could take a very, very long time. So Ansible lets you, your person fixing something or doing something scale what they're doing to as many different servers as they want to scale it to. Yeah, that's really good. And something you covered a few questions ago was you still need the human aspect when it comes to incident response and incident management for, for a company. And the SRE does help meet business and engineering goals. And now there's a resource that I was using on my last episode, which there was a company called Fire Hydrant, and they released a report of how many incidents on average small companies have up to large enterprises. And I find that helpful. And even like as an SRE or someone who's like in security, being aware of that and sharing that with the business early on, what would be helpful? Something I found is companies with one to 599 employees, on average, they have 10 incidents a month. And then they, they keep raising as the company gets larger. And I think that's very beneficial just so so companies are aware of like, hey, I know you hired me to keep the uptime, but technology is bound to fail. So that's why, what I'm here to, to solve that problem. Yes, I, I read that blog actually, the exact one you're talking about. I think you sent it to me or I saw it on something you posted. Uh, and it's very accurate from experience. I've been in a very large company and a pretty small company. And yeah, I'd say those numbers are pretty accurate and it's a good baseline to try to, to shoot for, but you know, you always want zero incidents, right? That's always, always the goal. <laughs> so what would you say is like a normal day in a SRE's uh, role? You're, you're working for a company, you wake up in the morning, like what are some of the tasks or challenges that you might have to work on any given day or week? Definitely. That's a really good question. And I'm going to answer it like this, it depends what kind of company you're working in. If you're working in like a very corporate company, right? That's huge, like a huge corporation. It, it's probably a lot different than a small startup. So from a really big company, I would assume that it would be a lot of incident responding, a lot of tickets like, Hey, this server is not responding for this reason, or a lot of escalated tickets through the IT support, right? Because it hits L1, L2, all the way up to SRE team. And probably a fraction, maybe like a quarter of the time, or like 30% of the time, it would be actually building stuff out. Maybe smaller than that. In a smart, small startup, you know, that'd be reversed. Or half and half even, who knows? If they're building out infrastructure and building out products and things of that sorts, it's working like a software engineer, you know, Jira board, uh, different tasks and epics and stories and knocking them out and code reviews. So it really depends on the environment, which is why it's hard to get good SREs or to get into the SRE field even because there's such a wide range of things that is required. So a typical day could go from uh, meetings all morning to working for two to three hours in the afternoon on whatever, you know, Ansible or Terraform, which is a tool to build out cloud infrastructure. And, or it could be you spent writing a Python script to build configuration files based on parameters because of this reason, 
right? Uh, or all day could be this production server is broken and we have to figure it out and everyone's figuring it out and that takes time or this deployment failed. Oh, hands on yeah, ex exactly. So one thing about SRE, it can go from zero to a hundred for pretty quick. <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's a really good answer. And thank you for explaining it, like the difference from large companies to smaller companies and, and what to expect. Yeah, definitely. Like, it, it all depends on the company, you know, and how many incidents they have, so, you know. So, and there's different types of SREs. Like one company I interviewed with a long, long time ago, they explained it to me. We have two types of SREs. We have the development SREs, which they're building out infrastructure. They're building out playbooks, DevOps, CIC, pipelines. And we have the incident response SRPs. Those are the ones responding to incidents, uh, answering customer tickets because they're a SaaS company that manage other people's clouds and things. So it depends on the role. It depends on the company because it can be split all different ways. I like to lean more on the software engineering side of the SRE and DevOps because I, I like to build infrastructure with code. That, that's one of my favorite things to do as an SRE and build out CI, CD pipelines, all this code, you know, nothing manual and make it all look pretty. So, What would you say would be the best way for someone who's not in the SRE, like let's say like they're on the business side or security and they want to work with the SRE or kind of, you know, normally a given situation may be like, hey, go work with the SRE team to get this product launched. What would be the best way for someone that's on the other side to reach out to SREs and to really build a good relationship? Because sometimes there, there is a bit of tension between different teams and, and the engineering teams just because they don't understand what they're doing from a day to day or how much stress they might be under. So what would you recommend for those individuals who kind of just throw tickets over, over the fence or, you know, they want to engage with the SRE team? Like what would you recommend for a fruitful relationship? I would recommend to be as specific with your problem, especially like the whole ticket over the fence, right? Not my problem anymore. I would like to see the original ticket, obviously what you tried, and your outcome of what happened after you tried it. And, and that's it. It's that simple. If it's something like access, you know, I need access to this product or this server, or this thing for this reason. And this person is my manager in case you have questions, right? Because some things, you know, due to compliance, only certain people can be able to access. So be as specific as possible because SREs are busy. If a company is using them properly, your SREs are busy. So you know, treat their time as valuable as your own. And, you know, hopefully they'll return the favor. And also try to try to learn a little bit about the tool. You know, like say you're a company that uses Docker and Kubernetes for everything. And you're a Python engineer, right? You know, maybe you spin up like a Python web server in your spare time or self-development time that you set aside during working hours, however you do it and try to orchestrate it. You know, uh, if you fail, cool, you have an SRE team at work. You say, hey, I tried to do this. You know, can, can, can you help me with it when you know you have a minute? Because if anyone from, any engineer came to me and said, hey, I tried to do this on the side to kind of learn a little bit about a tool. Can you help me with it? I'd be all over it. Of course I would, you know. Uh, so yeah, I would say try to learn a little on your own and be as specific as possible. Yeah, and I have found a difference. It's it's completely different working with someone that is spending time to self develop and and understand what other teams are doing on their own time versus being kind of demanding. I've noticed that there's a huge difference in how relationships play out. Yeah, for sure. And you know, the more you learn about what you're using, uh, that'll help you with your questions too to be more specific and get a quicker answer and a better answer. Because the more specific the question is, the less someone has to look into because they're going to know exactly what they need to look at. So with the expansion of the role, what are three things that you would recommend someone that's switching from either a software engineering role or tech background if they want to go into SRE role? Like, What are some things that they should be doing on their own time to be able to have more success in the interview process? Build home labs, like that Python example earlier, right? You can spin up a Python web server in one line of Python code, it's super easy. And you can also get a little more complex with it, and it's still pretty simple. Just following a straight up tutorial, copy and pasting code from GitHub, making sure it runs, 
and then like, all right, cool. I have this code that runs and does this thing, right? Uh, like opening a WebSocket or just a simple web server, anything. And all right, I have this thing. Now let me take this thing and orchestrate it for redundancy. So now it's on three servers or VMs on my machine. You know, you can simulate it. And then if you want to get really, really do extra, you can go on AWS, get a free tier account, spin up a few T3 micros, which are super tiny servers. And they're really, really cheap if you have to end up paying for some of it. And then start orchestrating your code on those three servers. Oh, I'm SSHing into them and running the Linux. How can I automate that? Which is another thing of SRE DevOps. Oh, that leads me to Ansible. So most of it is, it doesn't, you don't have to build an app that does something really useful. You more so have to get an app that does anything and then just figure out how to orchestrate it over multiple regions, you put it in the cloud, uh, put it on your own old laptops or Raspberry Pis. And once you start doing that, it, it, it'll lead you down that rabbit hole because it's more important of how to orchestrate than what you're orchestrating, essentially. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. And I think sometimes when people are trying to break into the field or trying to get into the role, they think it has to be super complex and they might be really expensive or they have to spend all this money. But realistically, you could build a lab in AWS for fairly cheap. There's YouTube videos out there where someone creates like a hacking lab with like five, ten, five cent budget because <laughs> they're super cheap, like the resources. Yeah. So if you buy like a Raspberry Pi, you set that up, set up your AWS lab, spin up a couple of EC2s and you start figuring out like, hey, what would be the best way for me to spin up 10 EC2s yeah. or at least two to start off with? Was, and how yeah. can I make modifications? So like, w what would you recommend for someone that wants to spin up a AWS EC2 and, and they're trying to have a, like a SRE setup? Are there any other things that they need to be downloading outside from having AWS account? What I would do is get a good text editor. I use VS Code. I love VS Code. It has all the cool extensions. And I read a blog or two on SSH, how to use it, how it works, what private keys are, public keys, how it authenticates. You don't have to get super low level with like protocols and all this stuff. Just learn how to use it, right? And then I would pick a infrastructure as code tool. Amazon's native one is CloudFormation, which uses YAML syntax. CloudFormation is good. There's a lot of guides on it. Amazon has a ton of documentation on it, and they already have ready-to-go CloudFormation code just to build something out that you can straight up copy and paste and run. I prefer Terraform, which is an open source alternative. And the power of Terraform is one syntax, one code, multiple cloud platforms, multiple providers. You can use Terraform for PagerDuty or anything, right? So, uh, so what I would do is... Find a tool to build the infrastructure with. Don't go into the console and click around manually. Uh, you can do that as first if you want, just to learn what the cloud is. Then after that, you're going to want to put it in code. So after you have your infrastructure as code tool and you built your servers, now you're going to want to do stuff to those servers. And then Ansible is the perfect tool for that. And it's open source. So you can just straight up download it. It's fine. You can use it. And... Learn enough Linux to get by, because you'll all, you're always going to be learning Linux. And you can always look up commands if you forget them, and that's it. You know those three things: a little bit of Linux, an infrastructure tool, and an automation tool. And you you already started as an SRE, uh, and then from there you can add in a DevOps tool like Jenkins. That's that's another open source tool. You can use that for your CI CD, which is continuous integration and continuous development. So yeah. let's say someone creates like a GitHub account and they follow your advice. Like how much would they be investing on the first month of using all these tools? Like what would you say their cost would be? It's a good question. All those tools are free except Amazon, AWS. However, if you keep it to like T2.micros, which are really tiny servers, or you spot instances, you're looking at like five, 10 bucks a month tops. The most I've ever paid, and I have a large instance that I develop on, and I spin it up when I do my personal development, I spin it down when I'm done, has been like 
$120 as a monthly payment, but I'm also doing other stuff. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really cheap. Just if, if you're worried about cost, keep it small size or lower on EC2 and you'll be fine. You don't have to worry about it. And be careful of services like SQS because, you know, you make a code error and start sending crazy amounts of messages. Uh, <laughs> that can cost some money. So at first, you know, but that's some advanced stuff. And, you know, to add to it, orchestration tools, Dr. Kubernetes, that's open source. That's free. So all the softwares you're using as an SRE and DevOps, you can do it all open source, all free. And that's kind of the industry standard too. Where it costs money is when you start using the cloud provider like AWS, GCP, Azure, uh, Linode, uh, what other ones? I don't know. Those are the ones I know. Yeah, those are the main ones I, I've used. I mean, there's like DigitalOcean, which people like using like DigitalOcean to like spin stuff up or Alibaba, but I kind of stick to AWS and GCP. For most of my stuff. Yeah, I've done Azure, AWS, and then a tiny, tiny bit with GCP. I like AWS because it's very mature. That's one thing I really like about mm -hmm. it. I like how mature it is. You can do a lot with it. So. So for like 10, 15 bucks, someone could really jumpstart their career and, and get into an SRE role after like a year or two of like learning, getting a job in tech, and then hopefully landing a good interview and and using all that experience that you, that you shared. Yeah, definitely. It's, it's really cheap to get into. And, and it's completely free if you don't do anything anything in the cloud right away. You can use all of those open source tools running your own VMs on your own computer or Docker containers and containerize everything and then have those containers do things and then orchestrate those containers. It's not so much what you're running, it's how you run it. And that, that's SRE and DevOps really, and how you're orchestrating it, how you're continually building it is a good way to put it. Mm -hmm. This almost reminds me of when we both collaborated on that hackathon for University of Connecticut. Like there was a lot of, to your point, SSH, like some people had VS Code set up, maybe others didn't. So even joining hackathons and combination of the resources that you mentioned would really set people up. Oh yeah, definitely. That hackathon was a lot of fun. That was really cool. And yeah, a lot of it, a lot of the like problems we ran into, I wouldn't really call them problems, more like hiccups was I got this SSH here. Oh, wrong file. Oh, okay. You know, things like that. So it was, it was good to do those. I did a hackathon in 2019 when I was at Splunk Conf. Uh, it was the, their uh, like hack boss of the knock. That's what it was. It was pretty cool. It was fun. It was, it was like a CTF, you know, different things are worth different points. Whoever had the most points at the end of it won. We got 35 out of 172, which isn't that great, but it was still a good time. Yeah. Top 35%. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah, I, I love hackathons and CTFs. Even after being in the field for like several years, I think it's still good to have that mindset of always learning because I see that people do lose that passion for learning. Like they get five, seven years in the industry and all of a sudden the ego will keep them away from learning and being being a student. Again. I ran into that a lot interviewing people. That spark is kind of just gone, you know. You got to keep the spark because... But that's what keeps you better, right? Than the rest. That's a, that's what puts people above. Not, I don't want to say above, but sets them apart from their peers. You know, is that self learning that I want to continue to know new things? Because if you silo yourself, you're only going to harm your career. You know, it's nothing good comes from that. Yeah, I remember when we worked together for for those brief months. I was always like, "Hey, Tyler, what's this? Oh, oh what's that? Oh, that's really cool. What you're doing with VS Code?" Yeah, and it's like these are things like these are programs that I've downloaded on my Mac, but maybe I don't go so deep into them. And working with someone who does have the expertise, leaning on their experience, and being being a being someone who wants to learn from the ground up, it's very helpful. Yeah, definitely. So switching gears a bit, you mentioned you've you've been working in the crypto industry. Well, like, what's your experience been working in the crypto field and meeting other other folks who also work there? There, it, it's been <laughs> kind of like a roller coaster. 
at least for me, because the recent things in the markets and, you know, Bitcoin going up and down, you know, everybody kind of feels that to a degree. However, with that said, everyone's I've worked with in the crypto space has been super into it. Like crypto is awesome. You know, a lot of them earn it for more than just, you know, a, a job, right? It's, it's kind of the community, it's the ecosystem, it's, you know, being on the cutting edge technology, doing it or in the, or even in that space, you know, is, is pretty awesome. And yeah, it's, it's just a really good community and it's, it's, it's been a good time. However, you know, the markets, they they can be scary sometimes. <laughs> it's like, oh, what just happened to Bitcoin? <laughs> That's not good. But then, you know, Bitcoin goes up or something else goes up or something happens that's good. And it's like, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. So. What's the current price of Bitcoin or Ether at the moment? You know, look it up and see what. Last I checked, it was like 24 for Bitcoin and like 1.3 or 1.2 for Ether. Something like that. I'd have to check. Yeah, it looks like right now it's like at 22,897. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is funny because maybe, let's see, 2023, maybe like four years ago, five years ago, it being at 22K would be like insane, an insane high. Exactly. And high if price. you zoom out on the charts, it's, I don't know, it looks pretty good to me. <laughs> having is come, happening. How do you say it? Did I say that right? I don't know. It is coming up. <laughs> happening. <laughs> <laughs> And what made you get into crypto where you, like you mentioned, you always had that spark, always learning. Was it something that you had a desire to work in or did it just happen over time as you were looking for opportunities? Like what, when, when did you first hear about it? I first touched crypto in 2012, 2013. I first heard about it and I was like, oh, that is really, really cool, but that's never going to catch on. And then 2017, 2018 comes around and it started to catch on. I was like, oh, well, I should have bought some then. Oops. And then ever since then, I've just been diving deeper into it, you know, looking at all different altcoins, reading white papers, reading roadmaps, looking at, you know, all kinds of different stuff. And even got a little bit into mining, had a few video cards and a rig set up. Then I got rid of it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, went to a few conferences. Those were fun. And kind of just sold on it. You know, I like the idea of Bitcoin. I, I like decentralized and kind of community, like community managed wealth and transactions and digital data and whatever, right? Whatever we really want it to be. That idea really strikes me as awesome because what, what's the what's the purpose of technology, right? At least to me, the purpose of technology is to decentralize the power. Right. Well, look what the internet did with the speed that information travels, right? If you're a bad person in the real world doing bad things, people are going to find out about it very quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, that wasn't always around, you know? So I think a little bit of that aspect kind of pulled me into crypto as well. You know, like the whole rebellious of, you know, down with the system, but not so much that to like a bad degree, <laughs> more like the, I have my own money in Bitcoin. That's okay. Cause I can do that because it's Bitcoin. Yeah. And history does repeat itself. Like when you zoom out and you look at how things were in the seventies, even when the hacking scene started, then later on when the internet came, came about. And then I saw, I'm sure you've seen like that notorious, like uh, news clip when someone's like, ah, ha ha ha, who would ever use mail when you can just write someone via envelope. <laughs> now, now it's like, do we use Gmail, Microsoft, like every day to communicate? Yeah. And I do see that same sentiment about digital currencies, crypto, and even AI to, to a certain degree. Yeah, for sure. It's just awesome. You know, the, the speed that technology has been developed since its inception, you know, it, it moves really fast and it's only going to move faster. You know, you bring it up AI, that's, you know, with recent things, you know, like chat GPT and everything, that's, that's pretty awesome. And it's, I'm actually looking into how to use it in my field and trying to find some good resources and things. Something that I saw, there's this guy I follow who's like 
he's he's been in the security industry for a long time and his name Daniel Meisler saw a video on Twitter and he I believe he bought the paid version of ChatGPT where you can get like the API token and he was using his iPhone and was connecting via Siri and getting responses to ChatGPT and like just seeing that video and I was like wow like people are getting very creative and it seems so simple yet for someone to be the first one to do that it's pretty cool and seeing how fast things are moving there is actually a new role coming out or coming about in tech that i read about the other day it's uh machine learning ai you know like chat gpt query engineer how to query chatbots properly to get like the responses you want the things you want Mm. it's like a whole it's a whole thing right i'm not sure how complex it is or how technical it is i haven't used much of the chatbots yet however it is a thing yeah that, that, that's something to watch out <laughs> for the next couple of years i'm just gonna save my comments on, on that role <laughs> uh so with your experience of working in the crypto and you're talking about the community have you been to any conferences like in person and what has your experience been with that yes i have i've been to to a few and overall experience they're fun you know, some are more technical than others. Others are more just a giant party for people to sell stuff and show you their product. And it just lasts a few days, uh, but they're super fun. And I went to Miami to Bitcoin 2022. That was pretty fun. That was, that was a good time. There was a lot of really cool mining rigs there. That was fun to look at. Like people doing fully submerged mining rigs and mineral oil, some having like water or liquid being pumped through them, but it's not actually touching the machines. There's like some nitrogen stuff going on. It, it was just crazy what people were doing there in the booths with the mining. Were the mining rigs on? No, they're more like demos, you know, like showcase. Some of them, yeah, some of them were mining. I think the, like the cooling systems were on, but not the rigs because they'd be really loud. There's a giant bull in Miami. Is it Miami that they have a, a bull? Yeah, yeah, the big the Miami bull in Miami. It's uh, like a bit has bitcoins on it, I think. That's really cool. Are you planning on going to the next one? I'm taking a year off from conventions and things and conferences, but I am going to go to some in the future. That's really cool. So since you've been getting your feet wet in crypto for a while the common question that people always have is how do you keep your crypto safe and how do you secure it after you buy it from let's say like any given exchange do you have any advice yes. on that self custody wallets it's that simple really let's use bitcoin as, as an example so i i had a friend who had some bitcoin it wasn't a crazy amount it was a small amount but you know it was theirs right and their 12 words wasn't working it, it worked on their old computer, the 12 words, but the new one, it wasn't working. They couldn't figure it out. It was like, why is this happening? They thought they lost it. So they asked me to help them out. What I did is I went to Google and I went to Bitcoin Core and I found like the official Bitcoin wallet. I can't remember what it was. I can Google it. But however, I got the one that is like the wallet for Bitcoin. Like the most simple, basic mm-hmm. 90s style GUI came along that supports all the algorithms and put the words in, everything worked, boom, the Bitcoin was there. So what happened? The wallet they were using was updated and it didn't support the older algorithm anymore for your 12 words. Cause all the 12 words are is a set of 12 words that get thrown into some code and it spits out a hash, right? And they updated that. So the 12 words weren't making the same hash, which is why it was restoring to an empty wallet. So we had to go to an older wallet that still supported that older hash hashing algorithm. And voila, the Bitcoin was there. So. And that's probably really scary for your friend when, when he was going through that. Oh yeah, he was so scary. He's like, oh my gosh. I mean, it wasn't like a large amount, but still, you know, like. It was their Bitcoin. They didn't want to lose it. I thought it was cool, you know, but you know, it's a valuable lesson. It's like, whoa, how many people does that happen to? And uh, 
So quite often. <laughs> what I would do is I would get simple simpler is the best, right? Now, if you have a bunch of altcoins and all kinds of different cryptos, right? I use Exodus for those. I love Exodus. It's a great wallet. It's very straightforward. However, you want it's self-custody. You want self-custody wallets. That's what you want. You don't want to like buy a bunch of Bitcoin and leave it in something that is a company that holds your Bitcoin for you. I wouldn't do that long term unless that's like their specific thing. Like they're like a Bitcoin vault custodian company that keeps it super secure. Right. But still, I wouldn't because I like to self custody it. However, with self custody, you could lose it. So, what do you do then? Right. How, what do you do with the 12 words? You write them on a piece of paper. What if you lose it? What if you, there's a fire? Right. You put it on a USB stick. What if it breaks? What if someone, you lose it? Someone steals it. You plug it into a computer and there's a virus that reads it. Boom. They have your 12 words. So, it all depends but I would use self custody and keep those 12 words somewhere really safe. There's some really cool cold wallets that you can like etch your 12 words onto like a flat piece of metal and it like comes with the whole wallet kit and it sets, does it all for you. It has all the tutorials. Uh, I forgot the name of it though, but it was a really cool one. So self custody, if you want to be super secure, get like a cold wallet hard. So like a hard cold wallet solution. Those can be good, but you always want those 12 words in case that thing breaks. Well, you know, what if your cold wallet breaks, <laughs> right? You still want those 12 words or those private, private key, however the wallet's configured. What's that famous quote, not, not your keys, not your crypto? Yeah, exactly. That, that is such the truth, especially, you know, anything, you know, not just crypto. It's like, not your password, not your bank account. <laughs> like... <laughs> 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 that's so funny yeah speaking of crypto like last time i went to new york and i was staying at an airbnb the airbnb host used to be like a guy who was like big into crypto and he he had that same wallet that you're talking about he had like a like a metal credit card yep. almost and they had like the passphrase into it. I, I forgot what it was called but i thought that was interesting and also what, what were the odds of Airbnb host being big into crypto. <laughs> Definitely, right? Uh, yeah, that's funny. That's good. And uh, yeah, I mean, th those cold wallets are awesome. What are the odds, right? <laughs> it's Airbnb. <laughs> it's like, oh, hi. Oh, whoa, you're into crypto. Hey, cool. Can, can I pay with Bitcoin and get a discount? <laughs> that's what I would ask. <laughs> yeah, it was pleasantly surprising i don't know if you stayed at airbnb where like the host is also there which i mean i was i was fine with because i was only staying there for a night and i had bought in like a large pizza <laughs> and I ended up sharing it with the host but anyways more of the story was like, they were in crypto and they had the wallet that that you mentioned so so yeah, self-custody <laughs> and if you want to be super secure cold wallets and don't lose the 12 words uh you can keep it in a notebook, put it in two places, two different safety deposit boxes. There you go. Problem solved. You know, it's as long as you want redundancy, you don't just want one set because what if you lose it, what if it gets destroyed, but you don't want like five, you know, <laughs> you don't want so many that it gets out of control. So. Yeah, I totally agree. So, so what would you recommend? What are three things, three takeaways that you would say for, for people listening or watching us today about the SRE role and for their business, what, what are some things that, that you'd want to leave them with? I'll leave them with hire an SRE early because when you don't have someone in the operational field, like DevOps SRE early on, you, companies can have a tendency their engineers to create technical debt for that area, like SRE and DevOps, and not even know it. That's one thing, you know, try to hire an SRE or DevOps person early. Another thing would be listen to them. You know, if they're recommending a tool and it might cost a little bit of money, but they actually show the value, you know, consider it, you know, take their opinions because they're gonna, because those tools are gonna make their lives easier and then they're gonna show more value for the company and then deadlines and things are gonna be done a lot quicker. And then third thing, would be go to the cloud. The cloud is awesome. Try to keep the cloud costs low and 
you know, maybe say you're a small company of one SRE, have them in on those meetings, you know, just so they're aware of it, how much, how much things are costing. And yeah, that's, as far as business side goes, you know, that's, those are three I'd recommend for that. For someone trying to get into SRE, I would recommend just start building stuff, start orchestrating things as much as you can. Play with a tool for a day or a weekend, see if you can get something to happen with it or do something. You know, it doesn't have to be anything crazy, just something very simple, like a connectivity test. Uh, and try to do some open source, you know, try to try to do some contributions, try to find some guides or some things and, or a project, you know, that you're using like Terraform or Ansible, something you're using and try to find a super easy issue and just knock it out. You know, something simple, something that isn't too much work for you, right? And don't be afraid to ask questions too. Like say you're a software engineer working at a company, but you have a DevOps team. Don't be scared to ask them a question about like DevOps or SRE infrastructure, cloud engineering, anything, networking, Linux, just be as specific as possible. And yeah, you keep learning about it. So for the folks listening to this podcast and who learned a lot, what would be the best way to get in touch with you, Tyler? The best way to get in touch would be to hit me up on LinkedIn and it'll be in the show notes and everything. So yeah, just shoot me a message, throw me a connection request and I'll respond. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you for joining us today, Tyler. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It was a great time. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please subscribe to my podcast, leave a review, comment, go to thedukeofcyber.com and you'll be able to find all my socials on there. I have a YouTube channel, Christian Galvin underscore, Twitter, Galvin Hacking, and Instagram, The Modern Tech Leaders. So feel free to reach out to me if you want to be on the podcast for an interview. My email is media at moderntechleaders.com. Look forward to getting to know you all.